We keep saying, what makes Farscape Farscape? Discovery, wonder, romance and humor. It's sci-fi and fantasy, to be honest. The creative cho choices are much bolder. Which is something that television's never really attempted. The creatures are much more alien. This show is huge. It's just much more out there. It's an epic television series. probably six or seven years ago, we decided that we wanted to try to set up a show that was a, a big show that, that sort of showed off all the capabilities of, of the Henson Company, the creature shop, and, and everything that we can do, and take some of the stuff that we're used to putting in features and put it into a television series, and really do something special. Oh, God! Eventually met Rockney O'Bannon, who had, um, He's created Alien Nation, Sequest, and, and had very much the right sensibility. And then he created this show and this premise. The same way that Henson wanted to take the series from a production standpoint in a very unique direction, I thought, how can we take what we come to know and like so much about science fiction television and Star Trek and Babylon 5 and twist it in another direction and take it someplace from a story standpoint that's uh, significantly different than what, you know, what, we've, what we've been seeing. And um, I think we've done that. Farscape's main character is someone from our own time, John Crichton. Hi. A man from Earth, John Crichton, an astronaut scientist, goes up one day in a one-man module to orbit the Earth. Now, approaching maximum velocity. His intention is to conduct an experiment. Electromagnetic wave. At the crucial moment of the experiment, an error occurs and he's suddenly catapulted through a wormhole, a, a, a shortcut, if you will, through time and space, and he ends up essentially on the other side of the universe. Once there, um, he meets and, and boards a ship of very unusual characters, which are right out of the Jim Henson Preacher Shop imagination. He comes from this place where he grew up, he watched E.T., and he probably has, in his head, he does, he has this idea of what it is to meet an alien. And suddenly you have a modern day human thrown into the situation where he's in an alien world. And it's nothing like <laughs> what's on TV. <laughs> Boy, was Spielberg ever wrong. Close encounters my ass. Talk about your American abroad. You know, he, dude, <laughs> he can't even get McDonald's at this end of the universe. It's time for us to eat. Eat what? He spends a lot of time figuring out what's going on around him and then getting knocked down and getting dragged around. And then he pops back up and uh, comes up with an idea to save his butt. This particle analyzer is defective. It's peacekeeper technology. You use it. Techs use them, not infantry. Yeah. Pilot said you press this, this, and this. Well, it's just like a VCR, except easier. The cast is composed of five or six core members, depending on how you count them, because um, some of them are human and some of them are not. Greetings. I am Pa'uzo Tarzan. This is John Crichton, Aaron Sun, and his eminence, Domina Rigel the 16th. Rigel is such a naughty, wicked little devil, bitter and twisted and f unique, funny. Miserable and um, all, all the more self-important and pompous and arrogant. And he's also a little bit like a politician 
um, because he's you never know quite what he's saying if what he's saying is the truth um, so you always feel like you have to be careful with him and you have to be on your guard with him don't you know this is an act of war when my council hears of this the Hynerian Navy will scorch this hellhole <laughs> That should get him thinking. I saw some dailies recently of me doing a scene with um, Rigel. And I look as if I'm, I mean, I was expecting an answer from this puppet and I got one and I just thought it was really funny watching me talking to something that wasn't actually real. And I know John Nicholson will be very upset with me for saying that, but he is a puppet. He's not real, Rigel. Oh, leave me alone. <coughs> I don't feel well. At all. Quit complaining. You're lucky to be alive. <laughs> well, I'm very that. I did the best that I could. And it wasn't in my training, you know. <laughs> Peacekeepers are trained only to kill. Mm. So don't forget that this peacekeeper just saved your life. Oh. And there it goes. John Eccleston, Rigel's main puppeteer, generally works at floor level. 20. There was a time. He views his performance through a live camera feed to a monitor. John's left hand holds a joystick attached to a belt around his waist, which gives him mastery of all the lip and mouth shapes. Another puppeteer operates the remote-controlled elements of the face. What? Twenty barrels of fluid! There was a time when you would have been disemboweled with a dull lesson spade bar for an insult to me! Thirty-five. While Rigel may be the smallest of the Farscape crew, Moya is without a doubt the largest. I hate Starburst. Moya is their ship. She's from a species called the Leviathans. Essentially, she's a giant space whale. Uh, Canaveral, Dad. DK, I'm being pulled. Uh... Moya is a biomechanoid, which means she's um, she's a living ship. You've been aboard Moya longer than anyone else except pilot. Your point being? You know her sounds and her rhythms. Just stop and listen to her for a moment. All right. Moya sounds fine. Does she? Not to me. Something feels out of balance. The people who built her, the builders, um, were able to instill in her race the ability to reproduce. What's great is the shapes are, they're all very organic shapes, and then the detailing and the textures are not organic. Ricky Ayers did all the production design and sort of captured that. <laughs> Look all the way from what Moyer's transport pod is right the way through to the tables in the maintenance bay or the galley stuff. It's I think you'll see that there's a, a geometry, a structure that's actually follows through, whether it be a thousand feet long or three feet long. It's not like you're walking through the intestine of a being, but it definitely has a definite organic feel to it. Moya, I will take your pain. Moya can only communicate directly with the crew through pilot. Pilot is, is a different race completely, but he is now grown into the ship. They're inseparable. A ship is a transport hangar. His personality is not particularly great for his job. He's a little quick to panic. He's overworked and, and harassed. And, and yet they're stuck with him because he's the one that's grown into the ship. A pilot actually lives. Pilot is the most exciting character in that it's the most remarkable puppet and that you can stand there and look at pilot and talk to pilot. He just comes alive. The puppet is made up of a complex animatronic head, which is remote control. Weapons fire on board. Moya's neural links are being badly affected by the heat. A puppeteer controls each of his four arms, while a performer sits inside to twist and rotate the body. He's the character. 
character that is the most angst-ridden. He's the great warrior of this piece, <laughs> a bit like the producer of the show. Weapons fire on board. Weapons fire. What? Moya's neural links are being badly affected by the heat. But I believe it came from the maintenance bay. I'm picking up five unidentified life forms and a ship in the transport hangar. The Marauder. Dargo is a wonderful character to play because he's, uh, he's gruff. He's like an adolescent warrior. He, he wants to be the strongest, best tactician fighter uh, in, in the whole galaxy. But actually, his inexperience shows through quite a lot of the time. So it makes him quite uh, three-dimensional. He's not just the, the blasting warrior. He's not just the, the incompetent person. He's a, he's a person who's 18, 19, if he was an earthling, just learning what he's competencies are and he's not quite there yet. No, I'm giving the orders now. Dargo, just listen. He's not good at listening, is he? He can't stand the fact that uh, that um, Zan is always trying to pacify him because in his mind to be superior is to be aggressive. <laughs> Let go of me. Dargo. The ship needs a leader and none of you have what it takes. From now on, I am in charge. <laughs> Never lay your hands on me again. I went to London and they did a live cast and from that we worked out how we could fit all this onto my body. Oh my god. His body is already covered in slow drying plaster of Paris. Now another substance, dental alginate, is applied to the face. This is normally used for making dental casts and is extremely quick drying. <laughs> Got a big smile on his face now. The constant chatter from the boys in the mold shop helps to keep the patient calm while in his plaster prison. Last stage, five more minutes. Well, I think it comes five more minutes. I said two, two minutes ago. <laughs> it's a James Bond minute. <laughs> When it does come off though, the mask, it will be very bright. Okay, it'll be like almost like flash bulbs going off. So your eyes are getting used to the dark. So just be aware of that. Using a photographic analogy, this cast is a negative from which any number of positives can be made. <laughs> Anthony's body can then be cast whole in fiberglass. After initial conceptual designs and prototype sculpts such as these, the final Dargo sculpt is arrived at. It takes a couple of hours to put on, different chin pieces and face pieces, and also there's a bodysuit that goes down to here because otherwise we'd have a very human neck. I've got a balaclava that fits over my head, then a helmet that sits on top of that, and then this piece here, which is a separate piece from this piece, where's the join, <laughs> sits on top of that helmet there. I don't think it will. That would actually touch. That would actually I'm actually a six foot six dorky guy with long blonde hair. <laughs> Even though there's all this, all these things on top of me. I'm still very much in control of, of eyebrow movement. You still get all the same facial subtleties that you get out of a normal human face. No matter what the others say, I see you and me together. Dargo, tell me, let me help you. Who is Lolan? As soon as you get a locked off mask, which you do get in lots of prosthetic work, then you really lose a sense of, of that character being real if you don't get all the subtleties of, of emotion and mood and psychological change that the face portrays. Unlike